All right, we are back here. Stanley Cup playoffs rolling on here on the podcast here. Rangers have advanced to the second round, take on the Carolina Hurricanes. We knocked the Islanders out. Back with you to preview that series and check in with the landscape of the league right now. Uh, the host of the Sports and Wayne Room podcast, Chris Ferruzzo, is back. Chris, how are you? Good, thanks, Mike. I appreciate you, appreciate you having me on again. Yeah, I figure you know, as, as long as the Rangers keep winning, let's just keep checking in, see how they're, see how they're doing. As long as hockey keeps happening, yeah. Yeah, yeah. keep finding me. Yeah, I'll keep finding you here. And uh, obviously, I mentioned this on my podcast uh, earlier in the last episode here about race is something the Rangers don't usually do where they have a bad team. They actually finish the job really quick. They complete the sweep of the Capitals. They move on to the semifinal round here. And this is something, you know, somebody who's followed hockey around here, that the Rangers, especially in the 2010s, like when they got these series against the lower seeds, they would tend to drag them out for some reason. You end up playing six or seven games like. I think it's very important they got this done in four because they are a lot of wear and tear in their bodies here. So having that, that potential up to a week of rest here to, before the next series starts is huge. Yeah, well, it's hard to believe, but also makes a lot of sense that this is the first time the Rangers have swept a series in 17 years because this is a team that might be the best team since the lockout that has not won the Stanley Cup. You have 2012, they came very close, 2014, 2015, 2017 will, to a lesser extent, maybe even the... Those 07 and 08 teams, but it's a Rangers squad that, of course, that had not swept any of those series. You go back to the 2012 team that had the best record in the Eastern Conference. They had to play a seven-game series, a seven-game series. You lose in six to the Devils. The year they went to the final, they played a seven-game series, a seven-game series, a six-game series, and then even a five-game series in the finals that had, what, I think four overtimes in it, yeah. and so – pulling off a sweep is incredibly important because it is very I was I was very surprised to find that was the only the fourth time in the history of the franchise they've swept a seven game series and they they need the rest very badly yeah they certainly do here and uh one thing I know the series too is like there were points where Washington played well in this series I mean there were certain periods you could say oh Washington won the period but or was that like it was very fleeting victories of the capital because like the Rangers were just like stepped on the throats again basically as soon as Washington got right back in it yeah, there were there were times where Washington was the stronger team. I would say, look, game four, they did what they had to do for a lot of the time because they looked like the the more desperate team. They looked like the stronger team. And second period, they were much stronger. But ultimately, the Rangers did what they they had to do. Washington had a couple of periods in this series where they were the better team, but a lot of it was also sloppy play by the Rangers. Charlie Lindgren did a lot to, to keep the caps in this series, which we expected him to do. And this series was for a sweep fairly close still on paper based on the, on the, based on the goal differential. A lot of that was Charlie Lindgren though. Yeah, that's for sure here. And uh, I think the key of this series though, is like the Rangers down has special teams, especially, I mean, like, a couple of shorthanded goals in the series here. They were dominant on the power play. Watching was bad in both areas. Like that's what the rest of you want to see if you're the Rangers here. Like you use ride your specialty down and play passively on five on five to get to get yourself deep. Yeah, Rangers played really well on the power play. That's been I, I feel like that's been the recurring theme in the media for the last probably three years or so is that the Rangers are only good on special teams. And I would say they're better on special teams, but look, they do enough at five on five to, to win. And obviously they did that. Now, how much can you go in cruise control? It's going to be very different against Carolina than it is against Washington. Those are that's Carolina is a much better team, but ultimately the Rangers did enough at five on five, but also they were especially dominant in this series on the man advantage. They were great on the PK Washington could get nothing done. And the truth is Washington for the last 19 years, when we think of their power play, you think of, well, for one thing, Nicholas Backstrom running the point and he's not there. And then you also have Alex Ovechkin hammering shots from the left, from the left circle and not only was he not succeeding at doing that, we didn't even see them position him, at least in the last couple of games, in that left circle. He was not the one they were running through. And I, I figure eventually you have to give him an opportunity there, but it was maybe a time for Spencer Carberry to just try to let his younger guys shine and just see what you could do for future reference. Yeah, I think uh, one of the big keys this series here was – the physicality Matt Rempe brought to the Rangers here. I mean, he scores the first goal, but obviously he makes this big impact on the series of the big hits, including the one to Trevor Van Riemsdyk in the th game three that basically knocked him out for the rest of the series here. Like Rempe obviously toes that line where like 
you want his physicality in the playoffs, but you do you run the risk he does too many stupid things and gets them gets the Rangers in trouble on the PK, especially because they're a superior opponent. That's funny to think because Rempe had Rempe's worst moments were probably against the Devils this year. Yeah. But what's also funny is the Devils were clearly, I, I think, target the reason they traded for McDermott was probably just to fight Rempe. Yeah. And 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 Rempe for most of that game where McDermott was challenging him, the first game where they faced off. Rempe just stayed away and did the smart thing, but then he does a dumb thing by laying out a dirty hit on Yoga, on Jonas Siegenthaler and, of course, getting ejected from the game, getting a game misconduct, and then he fights McDermott later on and, of course, gains their respect, so on and so forth. So it's interesting because, obviously, Rempe is somewhat smart is, is rather smart at times he's actually not a bad hockey it's like it's like it's like saying now look i think tom wilson's a better hockey player but he is also almost like tom wilson in that tom wilson you know when he doesn't resort to these sort of antics is actually a good hockey player Rem- rempy especially for a guy his size is not a terrible skater obviously he scored in game one but the thing is you have to be smart enough to understand what's going on the van reamsdyke hit i will say it was a tad late. I didn't get to see it live. I was working at that point. I had just heard that it was a tad late, but overall he had a pretty clean series and overall he played pretty well. Yeah. As you can see here, considering like they had a decision to make on that fourth line, the next series, because obviously they went the more physical Rempe against the capitals here. You wonder if maybe you play the speed of Johnny Brzezinski against the uh, hurricanes here. We'll get to that in a minute, but I think that those two and, Philip Heal is sort of in the mix as well. We know he's been practicing. We know they'll be very slow playing here. Like, if you were in charge, how would you play that fourth line? How, how would you set this up? I think, and this is probably the way I do it too, but I think this is how P- Peter Laviolette is going to go. I think he's only going to use Philip Heal, especially with the injury history he has had. I think he's only going to use him if he really needs him, if the Rangers really need a spark, which, again, you're playing Carolina. That'll probably come sooner than later. I can't imagine this is going to be a sweep. This is not going to be a breeze whatsoever. But I would say, yeah, he'll he'll wait a little bit. It's funny, when Philip Heedle last had his, had a la- his last big setback, and I think that was either January or February, I actually happened to be speaking at the time with a a former member of the Rangers organization. And that person had a source inside the organization that made it seem like, you know, he had, of course, remember he had gotten hurt in practice and the everybody, everything just came to a halt. And at that point, it actually, the, the, the idea that I got the, the, the vibe that I got was that his career might be over. And I'm very surprised that, and, and grateful just as a human being that he's not only, able to live his life but that he's actually back and playing but i would i would imagine especially with that sort of fragility that peter laviolette will keep him until he needs him that makes sense here would you think though he will consider flip-flopping uh rampy for brodzinski here in this series rampy for brodzinski is a possibility i would i would especially say because the hurricanes don't have a tom wilson no nobody has except you know boston as brad marshan that's that's the, that's the big one. So the Hurricanes don't have that sort of aspect. Now, if we see something again, like, you know, two years ago, that was the whole thing is that Tony D'Angelo and Max Domi fired up the Rangers after game three, going at each other at the end of that one. And then you see Truba lay out the hit on Domi to start game four. You know, if you see something like that, or earlier this year, Sebastian Ajo was that really ended a lot or took out Adam Fox for a long time with what seemed to be a knee on knee hit, no call on the play, no further action. And if something like that happens and the Rangers are, have obviously been, obviously been frustrated with how the league has treated them at times over the course of, yeah, this year, the last couple of years, maybe a, a number of years, if it gets to that point, maybe you go to Rempe, but I think you are right. I think this is a time that really necessitates more someone like Johnny Brodzinski. Yeah, for sure here. And we'll get to the Hurricanes here because they end up beating the Islanders in five. They closed it out last night in the day of recording. So I want to touch on the Islanders real quick here. Like, this is a series here where we thought the Hurricanes were going to win, not the Islanders that they got hot goaltending and they could push this year. But the one thing about this series that was very odd was just sort of like the Islanders had like these games where they had these leads and they had these, it blew them in frustrating fashion. They would give up these goals in like rapid fashion, the end of game two, I remember specifically that they, Hurricane score, I think the tying go-ahead goals about span nine seconds. 
last night. They scored two goals in eight seconds. You had the Kuznetsov penalty shot that was like basically the control or disconnect move, and they still get beat on it. Like, not a good look for the Islanders this series. No, and look, a lot of this, these game five goals I thought were – some of it was puck luck, but some of it was just terrible misplays by the Islanders. You look at the Drury goal, and, and Paggio makes a terrible play. He can't clear the puck. You, you saw it a few times. There was that bad bounce for Varlamov on the – I think it was on the, on the fifth goal. That Tara Vining goal to start the game was not a great one. It's from a sharp angle. It just gets through Varlamov. So, no, ultimately – Part of it is the goaltending, but part of it is just the Islanders just making bad mistakes. This is a team that is capable of a lot more, obviously. And look, game two, even though they were heavily outshot, they blew that game. They had a 3 nothing lead, and they just gave that game away. So game two, they very well could have won. Game four, they obviously ended up winning. Game five is a game that they very well could have won. There were a lot. There were probably three or four bad goals scored by Carolina. Even the empty netter by Nason, that's a misplay at the blue line. And so the Islanders very well could have been heading back to, 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 to Belmont Park up three games to two at this point. So just a lot of misplays for the Isles in this series. Yeah, it makes you wonder who the Isles too. Like this core feels like, it might have run its course in my opinion. You might, I don't, it's very hard for them to chase. They have so many guys locked into long term contracts here, but I don't think this mix is going to be like going deep in playoff runs anymore. It, it's all going to be based on that group of Martin, Sezikis, and Clutterbuck, that grinder line that has been so important for them. But the truth is, it's really getting up there in age. And honestly, a lot of people have said that for the last couple of years is that they were getting up there in age. 2020 and 2021, that was probably the the largest opening in their window where they just ended up going down to Tampa a couple of times and they could not get over the top though that was that was their their kryptonite and yeah th those three guys in particular might be closing I think they have a lot of guys who are still fairly young look Matt Barzal is still probably the heart and soul of this team Ilya Sorokin as well at I was I was a little surprised that they really went to they went away from Sorokin again that quickly after game three, but you know, you have a couple of guys you look at the, the defensive court Dobson and, and, and Pelic and Pollock still fairly young, but look, you look at Anders Lee and you're surprised at, you know, how old he actually is at least hockey wise. So yeah, it's, it's a group that's, that's closing up. But then again, you wonder, do they stick with Patrick Waugh? Because He's really his first, he hasn't even coached a full year with the Islanders yet. So, you know, we'll see how it works out. They're in a weird transition period. Yeah, they certainly are in a weird transition spot here, too. Let's get to this series here with the Rangers and the Hurricanes here. And it's weird because, like, of the three meetings they had, I, don't th I think, was it Ron Roll that like all three came prior to the deadline? I believe you. Yeah, I think you're right. I believe you're right. Yeah, which is weird because you can see here, like, the Raiders have not seen Carolina yet with Jake Gensel, which is a big deal. Yeah, it's funny. It's actually the inverse of the Islanders. The, the Remember, the first Rangers-Islanders matchup was the stadium series. They yeah. didn't play each other until February, which is incredibly rare. Because, you know, you think Rangers-Hurricanes, oh, you know, they've battled a lot in the last couple of years. Rangers-Isles is a, a rivalry and a, a rivalry of hatred that's really lasted. The, the hatred in particular has probably lasted over 45 years. It's a rivalry that's lasted over 50, and so that – is bizarre but yeah going with Gensel is going to be huge that's going to be a very big difference Rangers did make some moves at the deadline but none of them really that big as as the as the one with Gensel now look maybe injuries of course you had Fox out for a little bit you had uh, Kako out for quite a bit and we'll see if Heel comes back in this series so that will make a difference as well but yeah, it was an interesting regular season. The Rangers generally outplayed them with the large exception of a 6-1 win for the Hurricanes at Madison Square Garden, of course, pre-Jake Gensel. And so if you're the Rangers, it's can you keep that game out of your head because it's a long, long time ago. I believe that was January. And that's a lot, even, even if this is the end of the regular season, that's technically a long, long time ago at this point. And if you're the Hurricanes, can you go back and try to get past two years ago because Frederick Anderson's probably going to be the most important player in this series, in my opinion, because two years ago, the goaltending did not do their job and the goaltending, frankly, 
is the reason the Carolina Hurricanes have not won the Stanley Cup with this group yet, because they probably should have already. Yeah, I did fact check here. They did play once at the deadline in Carolina. Rangers won one to nothing. So that's a very small sample size to go off of for this series here. Yeah. And look, you can't always rely on a good one nothing game. I think the you know what now that I think about it, I think the Canes outshot them in that game. I don't know if it was heavily, but yeah, one nothing game. You can't rely on Igor Shosturkin to have a one nothing game every time. And again, best four out of seven. Yeah, I'm trying to look up here. Yeah, it was a 28-24 shot advantage in that game here. So this series, I think, is very interesting here because I think we think we're both agreed it's going to go deep, at least six games. And I think, obviously, here, this is something I feel like the betting favorites is going to be Carolina because, obviously, they have this deep core. They added the, probably the best score of the deadline, Jake Gensel here. So, like, what do the Raiders have to do to win this series? Well, uh, playing good defensive hockey again, that 1-3-1, getting the important – power play and penalty kill time, but trying to take some pressure off of Igor Shosturkin because Carolina, especially with Alex Ovechka not being too strong, Carolina is a much better offensive team than Washington. I think they're better offensively than they were two years ago, especially now that Jake Gensel is there. I, I think it's still generally going to be a pretty defensive series, but there's a lot of skill involved. Look, I think the more offensive it goes, the, the more it probably favors the Rangers but also the Rangers have the stronger goaltender. So really it's going to be about peppering Frederick Anderson. It's going to be about doing your job at on the power play and on the kill, but just playing well enough at five on five to take the pressure off of Igor Shosturkin. Yeah, I know for sure. Like we saw in the, in the first round series, the fourth line had their most, they were pretty productive in there. The first line had a lot of points. Advantage had had a huge series. So did Ryder. Rossi got on the goal line here. The second and third lines. Now, Panarin had two goals. We only had one five on five the whole series. It was in game one. We had the game, the third line. I think they had to get wait till game four to get a goal. I think they need more of those middle two lines to get beat the Hurricanes. It's true. The third line did only, yeah, third line did take a while. But Joe Micheletti actually said it on the broadcast before game four. He said they're due because Will Cooley had a very good series despite what his score sheet might have actually said. Capo Caco played well. And again, Peter Laviolette started to, to toy with the lines a little bit, games three and four. So I think they overall had a very good series. And look, I think Peter Laviolette will probably be pretty happy if you can play at a play at a, a zero or, or, a, or a plus and a plus minus if you're the third line, even if you don't really score, maybe you get goals from defense or you're getting goals off the power play, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, I, I'd, I would probably agree there needs to be a little more production. I would say, however, that it was a very strong four-line series for the Rangers against Washington. Yeah, for sure here. And uh, I, I would say I think we want to see Panarin step up more as well because we talked about it in the last round. Like, yes, he got the first goal, one of the first goals of the series. He got the game-winning goal in game four. But, like, he didn't really do a ton other than that. And that's not something you want to see if you're a Ranger backer. No, that's true. That's a good point. I, I would say the flip side is he had two goals in this series. Remember, he had two goals in that Devils series last year. That was a seven-game set. But one of the things is, you know, the score sheet is not everything. You look at him in that Devils series, and he's just trying to do too much. It was time and time again that he kept over stick handling at the blue line, at the at the at the New Jersey blue line at that point caused a ton of offsides, really slowed down the Ranger offense. And so it's just a matter of hockey IQ. And I thought he did a much better job of that in this series. But yes, finishing is is going to be important for him. But still, two goals in four games. Odds are this is going to be a longer series. He's going to have a bigger sample size. And you know what? Vincent Trocek really stepped up, but he benefited a lot from Panarin. So Panarin, goal scoring wise, yeah, I'd agree. He would probably have to step up, though. Yeah, let's also get, go get your quick take of some of the other series going on in the league right now. So uh, the ones that have finished up here, Cal like Colorado, blow like basically blows Winnipeg out in five games. Florida over Tampa in five games. Like, what do you think about what we saw in those two series? Yeah, well, Colorado returned to form after a surprising upset at the hands of the Seattle Kraken last year, having won the Stanley Cup the year before the Avalanche did. So this is a return to form for them. It makes a lot of sense. Winnipeg, Winnipeg, though, it looked like just faltered because they split those first two games at home. And you figure, okay, it, they're probably, they should take one out there. They don't. But even then, you would figure they'll go back to Colorado for a sixth game. They did not. This is a Winnipeg team that 
really faltered, but I think also really proved that, yeah, you got a lot of guys that are older on this team, but I think this is a team that was a bit of uh, ahead of schedule in their retool. So finishing with the second best record in the division might've been a little bit of a surprise. And so, yeah, they will have to retool a bit, but still with the year that Connor Hellebuck had, there's no real excuse for that jet, for that Jets front to not have at least made this a longer series. Yeah, that's for sure here. And I saw an interesting stat from the NHL's official, I think Instagram page yesterday said that three straight postseason we had at least one series of first round. Our team wrapped made three one deficit to win the series. And right now we got three candidates as of recording time, which is on Wednesday, May first. We have obviously the Kings down three one to the Oilers. Or is going to try and close it out tonight on data recording. Toronto won game five, game four last, game five last night, make it three two. The same for uh, Nashville against the Canucks here. Do you think any of these teams have a shot to pull off a three one comeback? I think you have the advantage actually if you're the team if you're coming back from down three one. I think you're better off if you're the team playing on the road. The difference is game five is the toughest play, to, toughest game to play. If you're the team on the road, game five is the toughest game to play. If you're the team at home, game six is the toughest. All these teams are on the road. I think the Kings probably have the weakest chance of the three, I would have to say, because Edmonton is due to finish off the Kings early. They should have finished them off early. Was it last year? I think it was last year, and I forget if it was – yeah, I think it was two years ago. They probably should have finished them off early as well. Seven-game series, six-game series. They need to finish them off early because they are much better than the Kings are. Now, for Boston and Toronto, I'm surprised enough that the Leafs bounced back especially after the audio and, and everything that had happened with, with Nylander and Matthews on the bench, Nashville, and Vancouver, Nashville probably has the strongest chance because Boston has had Toronto's number for a while. Nashville, I would say probably has the best chance because they have a lot of guys that still have experience from even though it's a while ago, but from that team that went to the final in 2017, Vancouver, very playoff inexperienced. Generally speaking, it's been a long time since they made the playoffs, at least in a non-bubble format. So I would think Nashville probably has the best chance of the three. Yeah, and obviously a lot of people have not bought into Vancouver as a serious threat this year, despite the, their strong regular season. So I think they're going to have a lot of pressure on them to try and justify their their place in the standings. Yeah, L- look, they they bounced back in game – in games three and four in Nashville, had a very loud crowd in game five. It's a hungry, hungry group of people in British Columbia in that building. But it's going to be very tough for them to finish this in six games. And, of course, that, that's that gone Nashville's way. It's gone Nashville's way. It, it is The momentum has swung back in their favor dramatically because they'll have a sixth game at home, a sixth game that their fans maybe did not expect to have. And – Odds are you'll get a seventh game in Vancouver and anything goes. Yeah, that's true here. And also the other series we didn't touch on yet here was Vegas and Dallas. Dallas, I think, was odds on one of the cup favorites heading into the postseason here. They're tied 2-2. And obviously, a lot of people, this course has been about the Vegas salary cap shenanigans, the long-term IR. All of a sudden, they have a bunch of high salary guys get hurt. They make deadline moves. All of a sudden, they're magically all back in game one. So makes you wonder here, like, do we have conversations next time we have a CBA roll around about this long time, long term IR should hang as the Vegas pulled every year? It seems like I really don't know because they should have had this discussion when when the, the Lightning manipulated this system with Nikita Kucherov in twenty twenty one. You know the are you kidding me? That whole thing with with Montreal in the final, and I don't know if they have this discussion. They should, but the truth is, has Major League Baseball had the discussion with service time? Because I honestly think that's the inverse of what this is. And so it's, it's an unfortunate manipulation and look, guys can get hurt. I get it, but you know, Mark Stone is, is getting booed heavily. Really. It's not him. It should be, you know, Vegas as a team that should be getting booed or it should be the league. It should be getting booed over all of this. I don't know if they're actually going to do anything about it. Yeah. You have to get a lot more complaints at the next CBA. Cause I mean, it does feel very shenanigan-y that like, you have three high salary guys all on the uh, all on the LTIR. Then Magic, they're all healthy for Game One of the postseason when the cap doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. So someone had a someone apparently had a jersey where it was Stone's jersey and it was taped over the back of it. It said LTIR. <laughs> it sounds about right. Yeah, it seems fair. Yeah, and this podcast is about before the series starts. You're really waiting a few days for the Rangers here because obviously, like. 
I think it, only because the Knicks are not why we don't have a schedule. Knicks still why we don't have a schedule yet because obviously it sounds like I think we if it was gonna be Friday we'd have hurt by now if they were gonna start the series on Friday. My my gut is Sunday afternoon would be my guess when they want to play game one. Yeah, you probably if if you're a Knicks Rangers fan you probably do hate that the Knicks blew that game with the Sixers, but also it probably actually benefits the Rangers because it, it pushes back that series a little more. You would think now, again, on top of that, even though the Canes finished off the Islanders already, you've still got multiple series that could still, we, we have multiple game sixes to be played, let alone potentially game sevens. So yeah, this thing could, could run, could run its course for a while here. Yeah, I feel like they're waiting. They're also be waiting for that Boston Toronto series to finish, to try and keep the East relatively intact on like on the same time, time table here. So, wouldn't shock me here. I know the the buzz on the internet, the rumor NBA at least has leaked tentative schedules here. They said that the Knicks series, either one of them goes like, I think potentially that wait, one goes to seven. They're playing the game one on Monday the sixth, so they kind of box together. It feels like Sunday's the target for the Rangers. That would yeah, that would tend to. To make a lot of sense, if you're if if you're a Knicks fan, you better hope that they finish them off in Game Six in Philly because they missed a huge opportunity. But of course, that's not my segment. Go on. Yeah, but we'll talk about the Knicks later on the pod, Chris. Thanks for all the time. Really appreciate. It. People want to follow you on social media. How can I do that? Yeah, you can find me on X at Chris Russo ninety eight C H R I S R U S S O, and you can find me on Instagram. My profile is at Chris Russo nineteen ninety eight.